Hello everyone, welcome to another lecture on medicine with Faison. In this video, we are going to discuss what happens to ECG when coronary events occur. There are basically two kinds of coronary events. One is where the blood is having a hard time getting through a blockage in an artery, where you have a narrowed area because of a plaque and the blood is squeezing through and there is a restriction of blood flow. This results in a reduced oxygen delivery to the heart muscles. This situation is known as ischemia and it results from hypoxia or reduced oxygen delivery to the muscle cells. The other situation that we are going to talk about occurs when a plaque ruptures and you have accumulation of platelet plug that results in complete occlusion of this artery and cessation of blood flow to part of the myocardium. This phenomenon is known as infarction. The physiologic difference has to do with how much of the wall thickness is affected by the process. So let's start with ischemia first. With ischemia, to put it simply, what you generally see is ST segment depression in the anatomical region that is affected by the ischemia. Now it doesn't always correlate precisely. Let's say you have a subtotal occlusion of the right coronary artery and so the underside of the heart is now ischemic. Now under normal circumstances, lead 2, lead 3 and lead AVF will tend to be upright and the ST segment is isoelectric with the baseline. So if you draw a line from one baseline interval between T wave and next P wave, that you will see the ST segment is about at that level. Now when ischemia occurs, what you generally see is ST segment depression and you can measure that amount of depression in millimeters. So now in lead 3 for example, what you will see is this ST segment depression and that can be a sign of ischemia. If you see it in the inferior leads, it points to the inferior wall. You can also see it in the lateral leads or the anterior leads. And in that case, it will be lateral wall ischemia or anterior wall ischemia, right? Now let's just review which leads point to which areas of the heart. So the inferior leads we know are 2, 3 and AVF. The anterior leads are V1 through V4 with V1 and V2 mostly septal and V3 and V4 mainly anterior wall. And then we have lead 1, AVL, V5 and V6 pointing more towards the lateral wall. Now what about the posterior wall? Well, we don't have leads over the posterior wall. So what we generally look for are opposite changes in the anterior leads. And we will talk about this later in this lecture. Now the question is where exactly do you measure this ST segment? Because ST segments can be depressed, but they can have a changing slope. You can have ST segment that slope down. You can have ST depressions that are horizontal. And you can also have ST depressions that is upsloping. So downsloping, horizontal and upsloping all have different meanings. Downsloping is usually more serious. Horizontal is moderately serious and upsloping tends to have the least significance. When we are trying to measure how much ST segment depression there is, we generally measure the ST segment at 80 milliseconds after the J point. So the J point is where the QRS complex ends and the ST segment starts. 80 milliseconds would mean two small boxes from the J point. So at this point, you would measure it compared with the baseline, which is the interval that follows the T wave. Now when the heart rate is very fast, for example, if someone is on a treadmill and exercising, the P waves and the T waves tend to run into each other. So the baseline becomes obscured. So in that case, we do have to use the PR segment as the baseline. On the other hand, ST segment elevation is the hallmark of an acute MI. In the case of LAD occlusion, if you want to look at V2, we generally see a pattern like this where the ST segment rise above the baseline. In extensive infarcts, the changes can be so dramatic that they are referred to as tombstones because it kind of looks like it. Now when the artery first gets occluded, you may not see the ST segment elevation. You may just simply see tall T waves or other kinds of non-specific changes. But as time goes on, you get that clear ST segment elevation and it may persist for days. What happens eventually is that this infarcted region becomes electrically silent. Over the course of several days, the ST segments come down. But what happens is whatever electrical activity was in this region heading towards the anterior wall was really represented by this R wave. With an infarction, what happens is the R wave is lost and you wind up with a Q wave. Eventually what happens is the ST segments become isoelectric with healing. But you are left with a QS pattern, which tells you that there are now no electrical signals in that region. All that electrical activity is headed away from the anterior wall. So we could modify this and say that acute infarction results in S3 elevation. But after some time, what happens is you develop Q waves. 
So the presence of Q waves indicate absence of electrical signals in that area. And that suggests an old myocardial infarction or maybe recent. It's hard to tell how long ago it happened. That's why a lot of people, a lot of cardiologists use the term indeterminate age or age unknown to indicate that the Q waves are present, but we don't really know how long ago the infarction occurred. Let's discuss some ECGs now. This is an ECG of a patient who presented with acute chest pain. It occurred while he was exercising and he is still having some pain in which you see is a normal sinus rhythm with upright P waves in lead 1 and AVF. This looks like an atrial premature beat. The axis looks to be isoelectric in AVL which makes it about plus 60 degrees. But when you turn to the precordial leads, you see this ST segment depression. It's not an artifact. It's consistent in every lead. I can see that there is at least 2 to 2.5 mm horizontal ST segment depression in V2 through V6. Also, you have a little bit about 1 mm in lead 1, not quite so much in AVL, maybe half millimeter in AVL. It's not exactly diffuse. In fact, the ST segments are isoelectric in the inferior leads. What you see here is ST elevation in AVR. Now you cannot have an infarction in AVR. So this is simply a reciprocal change. We would call this ischemic changes in the anterior lateral leads. This is almost always due to significant coronary artery disease, probably in the LAD distribution, because it's affecting the anterior lateral region. Doing a cardiac catheterization would likely find severe atherosclerosis in that region of the coronary artery tree, but just notice the appearance of this ischemic change. The J point is depressed, that means the point where the ST segment takes off is quite horizontal. Then the T wave remains upright. You certainly don't see Q waves. We have got these very large normal looking R wave marching across the precordium. This is not myocardial infarction. This is subendocardial ischemia due to a mismatch in supply and demand. Usually this means that the myocardium is demanding more than the coronaries can supply. Recognizing S3 depression as diagnostic of ischemia is really what we need to learn. Ok now here is the next ECG. At first glance when you look at V1 and V2 you see down sloping S3 depression. You think maybe this looks like another case of ischemia. But V3 here looks like only a little bit of horizontal S3 depression. V4 is isoelectric but V5 now you have a little S3 elevation. And in V6, there is a lot of ST elevation. If you glance over to the inferior leads, lead 2, 3 and AVF, you have got essentially tombstones. There is marked ST elevation with only a little tiny bit of R waves here. This is a picture consistent with an acute inferior wall myocardial infarction. There may even be some lateral involvement here because V5 and V6 have ST elevation as well. So we could be talking about a very large right coronary artery that wraps around and gives off a posterior descending. That would affect the inferior wall and a posterior lateral branch that would maybe pick off part of the lateral wall. You don't see ST elevation in lead 1 and AVL. In fact, you see ST depression in lead 1 and AVL. And you see the depression in V1 through V3 too. Well, which takes precedence? Depression or elevation? The answer is elevation is always more important than the depression. The elevation is what you should be looking at. And the depression is more of an electrical phenomenon that we refer to as reciprocal changes. It doesn't mean that the lateral wall or the anterior wall is truly ischemic. These are just sort of like the flipped over electrical gradients of the inferior infarction that we are seeing from the other side of the heart. In other words, if we take the heart in cross section and we have got the left ventricle cavity here and the right ventricle cavity here and we have a big old inferior infarction that's going on, well the anterior leads V1 and V2 are basically opposite to that infarction that's going on. So here you will record S3 elevation but from the other side of the heart. What you will record is S3 depression here and it's kind of like just the inverse or the electrical flipping of the phenomena that is going on in the heart muscle itself. This is a very important point because in a true posterior myocardial infarction, the posterior wall of the left ventricle really doesn't have any ECG leads over it. Sometimes in the posterior wall MI, all you will see are these reciprocal changes that occur in V1 and V2. In fact, a posterior wall MI is usually diagnosed with a tall R wave and an ST segment depression in V1 and V2. If you were to take this and flip it over, see now, isn't that cool? What you are seeing is a Q wave and ST segment elevation. So in a posterior wall MI, you will actually see changes limited to V1 and V2, but the changes specifically will be tall R wave and an ST segment depression. And these are reciprocal changes.
Let's move on to another ECG tracing. Alright, here we have a regular rhythm. It looks like a normal sinus rhythm at about 90 beats per minute. When you examine the limb leads, you see it is most isoelectric in lead 2 and so where the axis would be is about minus 30. So you have a left axis deviation and now the question is why? Well, if you notice the QRS complex in the inferior leads, they have a Q wave, a very large Q wave in fact. The initial deflection is downward in lead 2, 3 and AVF. Together with the left axis deviation, this is consistent with an inferior myocardial infarction of indeterminate age. So we don't know how long ago it happened. It could have been a month, it could have been 20 years. But the idea is there is a distinct lack of electrical signals going towards the inferior wall. And that's why there is no R wave here. Everything is going away from the feet. That's why we have got negative deflection here. So these Q waves allow you to diagnose an old inferior wall MI or inferior wall MI of indeterminate age. When you examine the anterior leads, you see that the R wave progression is not that good. You have got little tiny R waves in V1, V2, V3. It's only about 1 mm in V3, but it does grow fairly sizable in V4. So this may be a reflection of lead positioning. There is also a little bit of an interventricular conduction delay. The QRS complex is only about 100 milliseconds wide, but it almost looks like you have an RSR prime. So a lot of people would call this a right IBCD or a non-specific IBCD. But then again, some cardiologists would just ignore it. It's likely just a reflection of the damage to the Purkinje system in the inferior wall. Now what we do see here are T wave inversion in V1 through V6. Actually V6 is more biphasic, but these T waves clearly don't go in the same direction as a QRS complex, the way they should. But they are not terribly deep and there is no ST changes. So most people would consider this non-specific STT abnormalities. This ECG belongs to an old patient who came to the emergency room complaining of chest pain. When you look at the ECG, you see this significant ST segment depression in lead 1. It is horizontal, maybe a little bit down sloping, about 2 mm here. If you look at lead AVL, lead 1 AVL being the lateral leads, you see it is even more pronounced here, down sloping and almost 3 mm. So maybe there is some ischemia going on. If you glance over to V2, you see the ST segment depression. But when you examine the inferior leads, here is where the key is. You have S3 elevation in the inferior leads. And right away, what you have to do is consider these S3 depressions as reciprocal. So it is not the S3 depression that we were worried about. It's the elevation. So this is an acute inferior wall MI. In fact, it has probably been going on for some time because if you notice, the patient has already lost R waves. There are already Q waves in the inferior leads, indicating that there is no activity in that region. So this has probably been going on for a few hours. Which coronary artery would affect the inferior wall? Most of the time, it is the right coronary artery because in about 80% of patients, the right coronary artery is known as dominant. That means it comes off the aorta, runs around the right AV groove and then reaches the back of the heart where it turns around and becomes a posterior descending. So the right coronary artery in most cases feeds the posterior and the inferior wall. So whenever you see an inferior infarction, you have to wonder if it may be affecting the posterior wall as well. Now how to diagnose posterior wall MI? We have already discussed this now. We would look at V1, V2 and V3. In V1, there appears to be RS prime, so there is a right bundle branch block going on. The QRS duration is just about 120 milliseconds, so we have to call this a complete right bundle branch block. But when we look at V2, look what has happened. If you want to describe it, it is a tall R wave. Then there is this down sloping S3 depression. And then it is kind of a biphasic T wave. But remember what we said about the posterior wall MI. We don't have any ECG leads over the posterior wall. So all we are going to see are reciprocal changes. If I want to take this signal and just flip it over, now what does it look like? It looks identical to that, doesn't it? Well, that is because the same process is going on in the posterior wall. We just cannot see it because we don't have an ECG lead over that area. What we see are the reciprocal changes that are virtually identical to what is going on in the inferior wall. Let me undo a couple of those and go back to where we were. So this configuration of a tall R wave and ST segment depression under these circumstances is consistent with an acute posterior wall MI. So we have an inferior posterior MI because of a large dominant right coronary artery occlusion. Notice that the inferior wall doesn't have any ST abnormalities because the problem is mostly confined to the inferior posterior region. So perhaps it is unlikely that this was due to a circumflex problem. So remember, the circumflex runs into the left AV groove and goes and goes around to the back of the heart. 
but in only about 10% of the patient does it become the posterior descending and feed the inferior posterior one right let's move on to another ecg here we have sinus beats going on here with some sinus arrhythmia and then there is an atrial premature beat so there is a pse here and then a couple more sinus beats and if you look over here in v1 the lead changes here and it might look like a p wave but i think there is another beat that looks just like it and i think that is the tail end of the t wave right here so there does not appear to be a p wave in front of either of these beats and so i would call this a ventricular premature contraction pvc with the right bundle branch block configuration so that would mean it is most likely coming from the left ventricle but now you can see v1 v2 v3 and this is what i wanted to show you what you have here is st segment elevation and this really bizarre huge biphasic t wave in the anterior leads here going all the way out to v5 where the t wave is still inverted in v5 well in a person with chest pain and this kind of st segment abnormality this is actually known as valence syndrome it was described by dr hein valence in 1982 and it highly correlates with occlusion of the left anterior descending coronary artery so that was all about my cardiac ischemia and infarction this is quite a lengthy topic and i have given you just a kick start so you become able to study it further on your own thanks for watching